Town Hall. Uh, my name is Diana Cummings, and I'm the Adult Services and Outreach Coordinator for the Langley Adams Library. And I wanted to spend a couple minutes just thanking a few people. One being Geraldine White Dreyfus and her mom, Maureen White, for being willing to spend some of your vacation time and together time here with us and donating that time for us. And also very nice to have some of her relatives here joining us. Um, and I also wanted to thank Betty Gorski, Town Selectman, and uh, Kathy Pruner for helping to put some of this communication together too. I'm sorry? Where else? Happy where she was at. Okay. <laughs> yes, I think she might still be working. I'm not sure. Um, and I also um, like to mention a couple of our upcoming programs. Um, Wednesday, July 10th, we will be having Jay Atkinson come. He's an author, um, professor from BU, um, and a multi sport athlete. Um, and he has written several fiction and non fiction books. Uh, the Legends of Winter Hill, uh, Ice Time, Memoirs of a Rugby Playing Man. Um, so we will be having him Wednesday, July 10th at 6.30. And also in July, on the 22nd of July, we'll be having a music program. Sinti Rhythm, the Gypsy Jazz Music Quartet will be coming. And that will be on Monday, July 22nd at 6.30. So hopefully you folks will be able to make it for some of those. And I would just like to thank and introduce Gerilyn White Dreyfus, who is an Academy and Emmy Award winning film producer, um, who's done over 20 different um, documentary and short film documentaries, originally from Groveland, now out in Utah. Um, some of the films include Born into Brothels, which she won an Oscar for, or which the film won an Oscar. Um, the Invisible War, which we just played at the library this past Saturday, um, about sexual assault in the military. Um, and Kick Like a Girl, um, The Boys of bon Bonneville. Um, let's see, some others coming out include in football we trust the good the bad and the deadly um, and one in a billion and there are many more so um, let's see she has a wide background in the arts and philanthropy she is a harvard graduate and um, worked at the philanthropic initiative in boston and is a founder of founder and board chair of the Utah Film Center, and she co-founded Impact Partners Film Fund. And I'd just like you all to thank me, thank tornado warning, so that motion, um, <laughs> it means a lot, and it's really fun for me to be back here. I was telling my kids uh, that my fondest memories of this library, which or, was the old library where we used to ride our bikes down to the library with my mom, up that what seemed like a really steep hill, um, but also another fun memory was that when she ran for library, was it library board or select, oh, yeah. She and Joan Kranz are our next door neighbor, and Louise Casey, right? Okay. And I was explaining to my kids, I said, you know, this is my first introduction to politics, and Nana used to go door to door, and she said, I said, she used to wear a wig, and she used to wear a headband, she looked like a hippie, and they were like, Nana wore a headband? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but so anyways, that was, that was, it's fun to be back, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I was gonna, I think that the, the most, easy thing to do when you're talking about films is actually show clips. So I, I, I brought five, six trailers of uh, 
films that have either um, are done or in production. And um, I just thought I'd just give you like a little bit of a wind up um, to how I got into filmmaking. I was a, um, after college, I, I had always been interested in, in television news. So my junior year, I worked at a, a show called 2020 in New York. And while I was in college, I worked at WGBH for the science show Nova and um, a little bit for Frontline. Um, as an intern, and, and that, that was one of the things that I w was interested in, in doing, was maybe becoming a news journalist um, or an on-air news reporter. And then I got very interested in, in politics, too, and um, after college got uh, spent time traveling in different countries around the world, and then came back to, to the Kennedy School, uh, where I got very interested in the idea of social innovation and social entrepreneurship. And really, the, the the budding, you know, idea for filmmaking for me was I met these amazing people that were, you know, doing incredible things. Like Mohammed Yunus started in the Grameen Bank. Now he's a Nobel Prize winner. Or Wangari Maathai, who um, started a whole movement to, to to grow trees in Kenya, uh, and she won a Nobel Prize. And you meet these people, and they're so bigger than life, and their stories were so incredible. Like, like they were very archetypal stories. Like you, you really you, you saw amazing people make promises bigger than their ability to fulfill them. And, you, you, and so there was always drama you know, unfolding, people getting in their way, or people trying to stop what they were doing because they, they were so successful. And I had thought that they would be um, great stories, great films. And it, not only that, I felt like that, you know, that if you could document these stories in films, then you could see more innovation and replication. So that, that's how I got interested in filmmaking. And I had been working in philanthropy, and I noticed that there was a real bias against funding film. And at the time, 30 years ago, there was only you know, CBS, NBC, ABC, and public television. So the bias in philanthropy was that you know, if you fund films, you're only preaching to the choir because the people that are going to watch it are only people on public television, and it's hard to it's hard to figure out what film is going to be a good film. So, you know, typically foundations didn't fund films, even like um, Massachusetts cult cultural funds. The film gets very much the short sh shrift in the philanthropic pie. Part of it is because we live in a in a capitalist country that. Film has traditionally been a commercial um, enterprise. You, you know, people own st studios, and you pay tickets, and you go to see it in the theater. Whereas in most other countries in the world, uh, most of their filmmaking and filmmakers are supported by the government, and they consider film to be their cultural DNA and a, a, the way to go on record. Um, if you're French or you're Canadian, and, and and your film tradition is something that people have a lot of pride in. And here we have some of the greatest storytellers and the most robust um, uh, ability to make films. The ne next to Bollywood, we you know have us outnumbered by a fair number of uh, Indians. Um, you know, it's, it's it's just it's just an interesting kind of quirky phenomenon. That um, so the independent film movement really started about 30 years ago, and it started by Robert Redford at, at, in um, in Utah, where I now live. So it turns out that part of how I got into filmmaking was I moved to Utah, and I thought, well, I have, this is a new community. I want to, you know, find out the most interesting things going on. And the Olympics were there, and Sundance was there. So I started to do some work as a volunteer for the Olympics, and ended up putting on a conference at Sundance that Robert Redford loved. And so then I got involved with um, uh, the Sundance Film Festival as a volunteer, and then. Uh, the real reason I got into filmmaking is that Andy Levine, who's from Groveland, mm -hmm. came down to my house one day and he was all distraught because his father Barry wanted him to come home and take over the shoe business. And he did not want to come back to Groveland and take over the shoe business. <laughs> he wanted to make, be a filmmaker. <laughs> and, he, um, and it was a really funny conversation because Andy was, uh, I used to babysit for Andy and my mother actually um, helped him learn how to read. He, he was dyslexic and he was a screenwriter and he was an atrocious speller. And I would say to him, Andy, why do you want to be a screenwriter? Like, you, you, you know, like spelling is not your, you know, writing's not your strength. Why do you, you should be a producer because he's like a really smart wheel and deal kind of kid. He gets, gets all sorts of things done. 
And he said he wanted to be a screenwriter because he wanted to be a director. And so I said, well, then you should direct a documentary because you can just go out and do it all. And then the, on that day in the, on the porch, we invented a documentary we were going to do together called The Day My God Died. I said, you know, I, I learned about this. I used to be on the board of um, the Reebok Human Rights Foundation. And they, I, I learned that there were children that were being sold into prostitution. And um, there was a, this organized slave trade. And there was a young woman that who was blowing the whistle on all these people that were buying sex tourism packages um, in Thailand. And she was a British person and we gave her an award for her courageousness in the human rights field. And so we decided that a film needed to be made about this sex, what was then called sex trafficking. And um, it was really one of those, you know, be careful what you wish for kind of things because we decided, well, where do we want to do this? Well, we didn't know anything. And I said, well, let's, we found out where the largest brothels were in the world. And it turned out they were in Mumbai. Well, they said, we should go to India. We should show the world what the world's worst brothels are. So we got you know, and it was the early days of the internet. It was just one of those amazing things where I reached out to different people that I knew through the Reebok Human Rights, and we got emails back where people said, come on over, or, you know, bring your cameras. And then um, that's really how I got into the film business, is um, trying to save Andy Levine from coming back to work for his company. <laughs> and so um, we had a great adventure. We went over to... Uh, to India, my mom came and took care of my, uh, my, my, my now 13-year-old son. He celebrated his first birthday without me. He loves to remind me of that, <laughs> that I missed his first birthday. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, but that's really where, that's where, that's how I got interested in film. And I learned a lot going to the Sundance Film Festival by watching films. And I think really the only way you can become a good filmmaker is by watching a lot of films. And, um, and working for people who are good storytellers. It's still very much a, a craft in that regard. Um, so that's literally how I got involved in filmmaking. It's because I moved out to Utah, and the Sundance Film Festival was there, and it was right at the same time that Robert Redford said he wanted to do for documentary films what they've done for independent cinema, which has been pretty amazing. And it just felt like it was a little bit, you know, of luck and, 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 and historic, it's sort of a historic moment that, that documentaries went from being the spinach eating, you know, snoozers or slit your wrist films that nobody wanted to watch to the step, they were the stepchilds of the festival circuits. Nobody went to see the documentaries. And now you go to the Sundance Film Festival, people are talking about the documentaries interchangeably, you know, as much as they are the feature films. And in fact, I think that, um, the best work in filmmaking right now being done is in the documentary field. It's become, um, it is, there's a real uh, golden age right now where film, filmmakers are they're using um, narrative techniques in their storytelling. <coughs> it used to be mostly documentaries were very linear and they followed the script and they were talking heads and now they're very char what we call character driven. And um, so the change in the genre uh, since I've been working in this field, has been sort of like stunning. So like you, you every every year you go to these festivals and you know you you, you watch things and you're like, okay, that was completely original. It will change the genre, and it's exciting because people are innovating with music and animation and all sorts of things. So it's been a very exciting uh, opportunity for me um, since I didn't go to film school and I actually was just telling this young gentleman here that I don't think you have to go to film school um, to be a producer because I think the, the skill set of a producer is really, it's, it's really more of someone that knows how to put a deal together, they, know, they have to know what a good story is, but you help put the team together, um, you raise the money for the film, you help in the promotion and the publicity. Because everybody says uh, to me, you know, like, where do you come up with all these ideas? And I'm like, I have only come up with one idea. And it was Andy Levine's. <laughs> Every other film was somebody else's idea. They, you know, they, it's like you listen to people pitch you all day long, and you're like, that's a good idea. And uh, so anyways, that's just a little bit of like how I came in, got into filmmaking, um, uh, which was really very, very, very uh, circuitous and very kind of just kind of lucky. And it's been a fun fit for me, and I love it because you get to learn and get to travel. <coughs> and uh, not just travel physically, but actually travel to, to different places and, and really take deep dives 
into worlds that you never would have the privilege of, of uh, obser observing. And I've got to work with a lot of really creative people, and that's the most fun, is that nobody can make a film by themselves. You have to be, nobody can be a director and an editor and a cinematographer and the composer. Like, you have to work with all these different people, and they all bring something to the story so that it becomes more textured and layered and nuanced, and it's really a fascinating process to kind of watch what different people bring to the, you know, they bring to the project. So, with that said, I'm going to show you some trailers of some films, and uh, then we can just have a Q&A and talk about the whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, we should, can we turn the lights off? So, so the first trailer we're going to show is Born in Brothels, which was my the second film I worked on, and I met the subject of this film while I was working with Andy Levine in Calcutta, and that's how I got involved in the film. Led by the compassion of one woman. Take your time to look and make sure everything in the whole square looks good. She's really good at photographing on the street because she's very strong. Shocking. Children ask me for help. They ask for it all the time. And there's so little I can do. All I can do is try. There's so much information in this picture. It's just a beautiful photograph. I'm not a social worker. I'm not a, a teacher, even. But without help, they're doomed. These kids want to be out of there. Are there any boarding schools that would take them? No place is the right place. Nobody would take them. From the streets of Calcutta. My goal now is to raise money for them using their own photography. To an auction block at Sotheby's. Yes. Oh, they're all here. Amazing. I think he's reached a critical point, and if he doesn't get out of there really soon, he's lost. You and you and you have been accepted into a school. Eight children. People ask me why do I come and do this work. There's no rational reason. Born into brothels. Gopala, Gopala. Learn to see, learn to create, learn to hope. Think Film presents the story of a courageous vision and the children who made it happen. Born into brothels. So, um, so this yeah, film. Kevin oh, Pierre. actually, yeah, it's the next trailer. I just thought I'd just tell you like a story between each one of these trailers. So, Born into Brothels. I met Zana. Um, we were in Calcutta working on the day my God died. And um, it, the woman who took me to Calcutta lives in Salt Lake City, and she used to work for Mother Teresa. Literally, her father was the largest um, uh, Protestant mi ministry in Calcutta, and Mother Teresa was his colleague. And so they divided up the city. Like Mother Teresa was, she was really kind of a tough cookie. Like she, she was a very bossy pants, according to my friend um, Bonnie, and she, she would say like. All right, I'm, I'm taking the death and dying, and you're going to take the cripples, and I'm going to um, uh, d deal with the unwed mothers, and you, you do this. So they literally they divided up the, the city, and they said um, that her motivation was that she wanted to sh take down the caste system by showing people the concept of grace. So God's love and grace was what was going to actually um, be lead to success and the development of, um, of Calcutta in, in, in India. So when she was dying, she had a, she had a, she had a heart problem, and, her, and my friend's husband was her doctor. And they made her promise, no, she made them promise that she, Bonnie, my friend, would do something for the girls who were sold into prostitution. She said, they are the lepers of the 21st century. And, in, and if we can show the world um, God's grace for them, we will finally win the battle of bringing down the caste system. So Bonnie was scared to death that you know, she, she, hadn't lived, she, had, she hadn't fulfilled on Mother Teresa's promise. So when I told her I was going to make a film about the child sex slave trade, she's like, I'm coming with you because I have a big promise that I haven't made to Mother Teresa. 
which that would be scary if, if you hadn't done what you said you were going to do for Mother Teresa. So, <laughs> so I went to Calcutta with Bonnie and, um, and she helped us make the first film. And then after the success of Born into Brothels, um, we decided we were going to open a school. And so we have still not opened the school. But Bonnie's family um, has 120 schools in India and 16 hospitals. And so we're starting something called Hope House, which we've had all sorts of problems doing with, um, you know, corruption and people trying to take land away from us. And anyways, we're finally starting. We've got an architect and we've got the land. And it took a long time, but it's going to be an amazing project. It's going to be a school for 100 girls. It's not actually a school. It'll be a home for 100 girls, but then we'll go to one of Bonnie's schools on a full scholarship and we we're opening a laundry facility on the project on the on the property so that the mothers uh, who have been sold into prostitution if they want to leave because one of the big problems is they don't want to they don't want to they don't want their kids to go away to private schools because they love their kids you know they so so if, so if these mothers would like to leave um, the brothels and get a job working in these laundry facilities they'll do the linens for all of the hospitals that Bonnie's family runs mm -hmm. and then we're also building a school of social work and nursing there there's a nursing shortage we're not building it Bonnie's family is but it's on the same property so there's a there's a real nursing shortage in India and <clears throat> so we've opened a clinic um, uh, in the, the, the brothels that are born into brothels uh, takes place and have been providing um, health care things for HIV AIDS and um, hepatitis and all sorts of things. And that's how we've recruited the families that will have their daughters come to the school. And <clears throat> the other fun thing about the film is that two of the kids in the film actually live with us in, our, in Salt Lake City. One went to the same high school my uh, children go to. And he just graduated from NYU in film. And he just, um, he just, it got his first job. Um, he's working uh, in India on a, on, a, on a Bollywood American musical. Um, it's a Hollywood finance film, and uh, he had his first 105-day shoot that he. So he's he's kind of on his way. And the other little girl, Kochi, who lived with us, um, her mother died when she was in uh, boarding school. She was going to a boarding <coughs> school in Utah, and then she'd stay with us when when she had breaks. And then when she went back, because she spoke English so well, her family wouldn't let her come back and finish the school because she could make money being one of those call people, you know, that you get on Delta Airlines or something. So she's, <laughs> she's been actually, the school has actually allowed her to finish her high school degree online. So it's, that's been really fun. One of the things I love about this work is that, it, it, because I used to work in, with social entrepreneurs before and in philanthropy we've kind of been able to bring all those worlds together with these films because you can raise money for things, you can use the film for education, you can use it for outreach, but often uh, practically every film that we've done we've had a le what we call a legacy project of the film and in the, in the film Born into Brothels it's going to be this school called Hope House and um, <clears throat> I told Bonnie we should call it Mother's, we should name it after Mother Teresa since you know, then she, <laughs> since she made that promise. So we'll see if that happens, but that's the little born to brothel stories. We, the, next, um, the next film I'm going to show you is called Crash Reel. It just premiered at, at Sundance uh, this year. Um, it will be on HBO on July 15th. It's a story of Kevin Pierce, who um, is from Vermont. He was at one time the number one snowboarder in the world about to eclipse Sean White and had a traumatic brain injury um, 14 days before he headed to Vancouver for the Olympics. And this is his story. 21 years old, born and raised in North Vermont. saying that you're Olympic hopeful, I think it says a lot. I'm super excited to uh, be going for it. Kevin Pierce, the favorite to make the high-flying U.S. team. The 22-year-old is one of the few voters to actually beat top-ranked Sean White. Snowboarder Kevin P. 
Pierce remains in critical but stable condition tonight. Am I even the worst thing I've ever seen in my life? Like, that only one time. How you doing? Did you have a great day today? Do you know your nickname, Kev? Sure. I can't let you do that. Medically and neurologically, you cannot afford to hit your head. I just can't tell that it ever It comes to the point where I'm just ready to release from it all. And I feel like looking at you. Your, the, your, what your family's been through. I don't want you to get hurt again because of how much I, I think you wouldn't be happy. Seeing then that gets right back to the, to my point that I've had this entire time that you guys just have no faith. But I feel 100% confident. No, uh, I just don't want to be done. Okay, so we need to finalize our plans for the day that Kevin wants to get back on snow for the very first time in two weeks. I feel like I'm psyched, you know, a little nervous, I'm not gonna lie. First contest back, what's it? Just over two years. Once you get into it at that level, it's very hard to get out of it. The only way to be successful in that sport is to push the limits. If you don't push the limit, you're not going to the top. And everybody's having bad falls. Champion freestyle skier Sarah Burke. She is in critical condition right now after an accident on a train run left her with a traumatic brain injury. It happened on the exact same course where snowboarder Heaven Pierce suffered a traumatic brain injury in 2009. It's not like I was put through this, it's not like a bomb went off and it exploded in my head. I was snowboarding and I fell and we did not want to screw this thing up like we did. Because mine screwed up too, man, but you've got to love it. You've got to realize that things have changed now. You can change this. You can get better. you got to work hard and love them. So uh, the, the most remarkable thing about this story is it's, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's not a story about snowboarding, it's a story about a remarkable family. And um, I'm Simon Pierce, the wonderful glassblower, and his wife Pia are extraordinary parents of four sons, including David, the young man who has Down syndrome. And I think they would say that, you know, they spent their life managing risk and um, and wanting their son David to have the most self-actualized life that he could have with his brain, and that really prepared them for Kevin's um, brain injury. And um, so the, I, David, for me, and Pia are the real stars of the movie. The, the, the brother with the Down syndrome, he just, he says the elephant's in everybody's thinking. He's like, the elephant in the room, David just blurts out. So you got these incredible cinematic moments with this family as they were trying to navigate through how do they allow their 24-year-old son to make decisions, even though they weren't the best decisions, and even though he wasn't really functioning at his capacity with his brain or um, just reason. And uh, Kevin's gone on to become um, a real, you know, he's just a great kid, and he's, he's, he's now covering the X Games. And his goal is to um, <clears throat> is to be the commentator for the Soji Games, and the American Olympic team has asked him to carry in our flag, which is a real tribute to him. And so he's just a remarkable young man, and he he had to go through. His parents were so so patient in letting him get to the to the point where he had to figure out for himself he was never going to be able to compete again. And um, that was really tough. When we were making this film, we were we were covering him, and we were thinking, "This is crazy! Like he he's going to go out there and 
bored again? And what if he dies while we're filming him? Like, he, it was very, very risky. And he didn't want to believe how risky it was. And it really wasn't until the very last scene where he's, t he's talking to this other kid who's had four brain concussions <coughs> and can't tell you whether this is his elbow or, I mean, he's, 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 his brain is so scrambled. And when Kevin saw how bad he was, he realized, I can't do this again. I can't do it to myself and I can't do it to my family. So it just sort of follows that arc of, um, you know, kind of assessing risk and, and trust. And um, it's a beautiful, just a beautiful film about an amazing family. And it will be on HBO on July 15th. And my daughter just came back from, they, when Kevin was hurt, they started something called the Friendly Gathering. And Kevin was, you know, really loved in the sport because he never was like Sean White, who like just trained by himself and was very proprietary about everything that he did. He always trained with his friends, and they called themselves friends, F-R-E-N-D, because there's no I in friendship. Um, and uh, so he, they, when he got hurt, I mean, the whole extreme sport community got behind rallying for him with those I Ride for Kevin, you know, stickers. And his friends started something called the Friendly Gathering. Up in up in Vermont, and every year they have these concerts, and artists come. And my daughter and um, uh, her cousin just came back from it, and so they've kept up the tradition. Now that Kevin's better, um, but they they just brought the you know the whole com the whole industry came together to support him, and this is this has been the, that's sort of Kevin's legacy, you know the sports legacy, and the social side of this film is. Uh, we're going to do a lot of work with uh, veterans who, um, or a number of our veterans are coming home with traumatic brain injuries and, um, and also um, we're working with ski resorts to create what you could, Kevin started a campaign called Love Your Brain and it's about helmet safety and nutrition and exercise and um, so uh, we're signing up ski resorts to be Love Your Brain ski resorts, and they will, Burton will be giving stickers to any kid that wears a helmet, and they'll be taking like two dollars off your lift tickets if you're wearing a helmet, and you're part of the Love Your Brain campaign. So we're, we're um, literally, you know, we had all five ski resorts in Utah during um, Sundance sign up for it. We had a big launch, and we're working, you know, with there's like trade shows and meeting. My my brother has a friend who is owns Mount Abrams and I told him about it yesterday. He goes, sign me up. You know, so like, I mean, this, the resorts, they don't know what to do about the health, that helmet thing because you can't force someone to wear a helmet because then if, you know, some helmets work, you know, if you get injured while you're wearing a helmet, they don't want the liability. So it really has to be about education and sort of the way seatbelts was. Like you, 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 they want to, they want people to wear helmets, but they can't say you have to because then if you get injured, they, they don't want to take on the liability. So it's a tricky issue. <clears throat> so the next clip, what is the next one we're doing? I forget. That's okay. I That's show it. <laughs> oh, I think it's in the It's a visible one. He hit me in the head and knocked me out. I remember holding the closet thinking, what just happened? A month later, I found out I was pregnant. If this is happening to me, surely I'm not the only one. Sixteen thousand one hundred and fifty service members were assaulted in 2009. About half a million women have now been sexually assaulted in the U.S. military. They let this man get away with everything but murder. They gave him Military Professional of the Year Award during the uh, rape investigation. They made it very, very clear. If I said anything, they were going to kill me. Most Americans assume that there is access to a system of justice. You would think that because the military is about protecting our country, that certainly they would want to protect their own. We're a country who needs every good soldier to make sure we have a strong military defense. 
How many women are leaving the military because they've been sexually assaulted or raped? Civilians see it as being a military problem. Most rapists are repetitive criminals. They hear it again and again. They go on to literally prey on women and men, girls and boys in our neighborhoods back home. When does this ever end? It's very difficult to do a story on the most powerful institution in the world. The Department of Defense has a history of covering up sexual offense problems. I don't know who you think elected you to defy the Congress of the United States. What is it you're trying to hide? This film was nominated for an Academy Award this year, and it was very um, moving. Corey, who you saw the little girl who was crying, that said, you know, what just happened? She was there. Um, and these are the kinds of things, these are the kinds of things that happen that just, you know, you just you can't put a price tag on. But And another one of the subjects of the film, Ariana, who was raped uh, in the, but in the Marines, right near the White House. She was in like a very elite, um, uh, part of the Marine Corps, and um, her husband was was like a Harvard, Yale trained military officer, and he quit because of the way his wife was treated. And so the the two of them and Corey have been going around the country working on this issue. And Corey uh, came to the Academy Awards with her mother-in-law, who was taking care of her kids, and. Um, she basically, in an interview, said, this film gave me my life back and it gave me my family back. Apparently after uh, she came back, her, her mother-in-law had been telling her husband, you need to divorce Corey, she's a mess, she's not, not, not fit to be a mother, she's on too many meds. And then her mother saw the movie, her mother-in-law saw the movie, and she stood up publicly and apologized to Corey and said how she had no idea that this had happened. Because most of these people had never told anyone in their family, so it was very brave for them to do the film. And so, um, you know, her mother-in-law, she, she was with her with her kids, like going down the red carpet. It was like so beautiful. And um, same with uh, Ariana, her, her husband, um, you know, he just like filled up in tears and he gave me this big hug and he said, you know, she came, she had gained a lot of weight right after, she got very depressed, and um, she, get, she trained for the Academy Award. She lost 40 pounds, and she came in a dress that looked like she was ripped like Hillary Swank was that year, that she was like the, the million dollar baby. And, and she just kind of marched out, and everybody was just like, you know, they, they thought she was a movie star, and she was. <laughs> so it was really great. Um, and this film, I, I've never been involved with a film that sort of has hit more of uh, more nerves and uh, kind of what you call a perfect storm, the combination of us, uh, the president choosing a new um, head of the Department of Defense, um, the, the, the scandal, the Petroy the sex scandal, where we were able to use social media to really go out and say, no, the real sex scandal is what's happening here, not what's happening there. Um, <clears throat> we also had. Um, you know, this knucklehead who's a head of sexual, military sexual assault who then gets convicted of sexually assaulting. So those kinds of moments, like that, the, they just kind of kept, kept the story on the front page. And so it's like you, you can't open a newspaper or read it, you know, every, there's a cartoon. I mean, every cartoon, you know, every political satirist in, in this country has done something about this. And it was very disappointing that the bill did not pass, the, but this Senator um, Gillibrand is, she is incredible. I didn't even, I never met her. I didn't even know, you know, I didn't know anything about her. But the women that are in Congress right now, um, Nikki Songus is another incredible champion on this issue. It reminds me of um, the Pat Schroeder, Anita Hill moments. Like these, it, if we didn't have these women elected, this, this issue would continue to be swept under the rug. And they are fighting so ferociously um, and literally <clears throat> Our new Secretary of Defense called like he he every single part of the Senate confirmation these women were like 
what are you going to do about sexual, military sexual assault and have you seen the film? It was the first question that they asked him. So he's like, I've got to get a copy of this film. Mm -hmm. And he's been great. And unfortunately, um, I, I think the bill will be reintroduced in July. And I, I think if, if public pressure stays on it, I think we will get the military chain of command um, fixed or chain, uh, changed. And there's a, lot of con there's, a lot of, there's a lot of controversy around that because it takes an act of Congress to actually change in the way our system set up with the executive branch, you have to have the you know the, the president's office and the commanders of chief and um, Congress to agree to change something like this. So it's a big deal, and so the military is take is not is taking that very seriously because they it, it sets a precedent that other things could be changed too. So I think that there there's reason for them to hit the pause button, but there's also real reason for them to clean up this problem. Um, which has been growing. And the, the thing that I find exciting when we first looked at this film was, you know, the military has done so many things so well. Like when, when, when they took on race in, as an issue, it changed our culture. And when, when, when we used to have segregated troops and, and when you were in the military, you had to be colorblind. And so if the military can clean up violence against women, or violence, it's not just violence against women, men are raped too, but if they can take on this issue, so that it's not okay for this to happen. I think it will have a huge impact on our culture as a society. And, um, and that's what we're banking on. We, we, we expect the military to take this very seriously. And, and then I think it, it, will be, it will be good for the, it will be not only good for our soldiers, but it will be good for, the, for our country. So, um, so that's Invisible War. A revolution is what we witnessed. The police keep trying to disperse the protests. You can see the protesters just keep pushing them back. Saying that Hotin Mubarak is stepping down. We are seeing history unfold Egypt in the Middle East. Egypt will never be the same. Is it true? Is that happened? I don't know. It's like it. You want me to start from why did we go down? The second of the day is always second of the day. <laughs> I had a phone call from the army, I think, telling me to take the cameras off the Hamlet Square because the scene would be ugly. The army entered the offices of most media outlets surrounding the square and confiscated equipment, trying to prevent these kinds of, of pictures uh, from emerging. <laughs> Breaking news out of Egypt. Most of them not videotaped. They're deaf, not recorded. 
proud of because uh, the director is a young uh, woman by the name of Jahan Nujam and she's, she was born and raised in Cairo. She actually went to Milton Academy and, and to Harvard and um, she started out as one of the first sort of women DPs and she has been working on this film um, for the last four years. Uh, she's been shot at, she's been thrown in jail. Uh, just last week they were back in their um, office with invaded and they took all the hard drives and the cameras so that but she and the, the gentleman that's in the film that says um, you know we can't depend on the world to tell our story we have to tell our stories ourselves his name is uh, Khalid Abdullah and he is an actor he was in the kite runner he was in United 93 and he was in the green zone and with Matt Damon and his father and his grandfather had been trying to overthrow the Mubarak regime for 70 years and he had been living in exile in London and he came back and he's given up his entire career as an actor and set up these citizen journalism schools. So that's really the, the plot line of the film is really training these young kids how to use Facebook, how to use Twitter, how to use their cameras to make sure that the stories still are getting out. And we had this film at Sundance this year. We tried to, we tried to take it out because it wasn't finished. Um, and we just couldn't get the film finished in time. And the story kept unfolding as, as it is today. And they're over there right now um, filming the last sequence for the film, which will now have its world premiere as a finished film at the Toronto Film Festival this September. But the, um, the, uh, the, the trajectory of this film is just so sad to me because Egypt was one of our greatest allies and it's been a secular nation and it, and it has gone from <coughs> the young people on the square were first called heroes when they brought Mubarak down and then when the military took over they were called thugs and now that the Brotherhood and um, President Morsi is in they're being called infidels and sinners so it, the, it, it's you know the country is now being becoming much more fundamentalist in its religious beliefs and there was in, being in, incredibly abusive to women that are down in the square. Um, so you just see, you see sort of this trajectory and you, you hope to God it doesn't go by the way of Iran, but it, it feels like that's where it's headed. So they are back there filming again um, and it's a very cautionary tale. It doesn't have a happy ending. And I, I think this will be something that Jahan will work on for the next 10 years of her life. I mean, I think it's, she's really created a historical record of her country in, in one of the most important historical moments of the Middle East. And mom, my daughter, Ricard, is working as an intern for this film. And she's very inspired by um, all the young people that are working on this film. I mean, none of them have any training at all. And they're just down there day and night. Um, so that one will be finished. Um, for September. And the next one, which I think is our last one, is 
One in a Billion, which is the first romantic comedy that I've ever worked on, and it's a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to end on something that's funny. <laughs> Oh no, this one's midway. I've got two more. Yeah. This, is, this is not fun. This is, not fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually really sad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do we have the courage to face the realities of our time and allow ourselves to feel deeply enough that it transforms us and our future? films where you know you saw it and I was like okay I've never seen anything like this before <coughs> this is going to change um, the genre of, 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 of documentary filmmaking and we um, we hired the editor that did March of the Penguins and it, it's it's finished the film is finished it's absolutely one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen it's like a, um, a Terrence Malick film it's like a poem and it's being narrated by the person who introduced me to this film. His name is Terry Tempest Williams. She's a writer from Utah. She wrote a book called Refuge. She's like the Rachel Carson of our time. She's a beautiful environmental writer. And she um, was friends with Chris Jordan, the photographer that is making this film. It's his first film. And she asked me if I would help him. And um, 
she's writing the narration for the film, and the film will be told through the voice of the island. So it'll be a woman's voice that will just sort of tell the story of the island of Midway and everything that she's seen. Um, because uh, obviously we know the Battle of Midway is a very um, a, you know, emblematic uh, base uh, and, and it's now run by the U.S. Fish, Fish and Wildlife. But it's also been a rookery for albatross for you know, tens of thousands of years. And so they're eating all that plastic that's coming up, that's washed up on shores and coming out of the oceans, and it's very close to where that big plastic garbage dump. So unfortunately, these things are really big enemies, these plastic bottles, and this is the whole outreach around the film is gonna be about reducing plastic. And it's the bottle caps more than anything because they, they don't get recycled. So if you saw the number of bottle, bottle caps in those stomachs of those birds, it's in the, the mothers are just picking them up and forcing them down. They're just, they're doing what, they've been trained to do instinctually for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and this uh, trailer, we're very excited about this film, this trailer has gone what they call, you know, hyper-viral. Over 10 million people have seen this tra trailer, and we can track which countries, and it turns out the French and the Canadians are the ones that are watching this film the most, but we, we, we feel like this will have a huge global um, impact. The film will be really travel um, all over the world. And, and we're, we're literally just um, doing what they call locking picture uh, right now. And Terry's finished her deadline to finish her narration is today. And our hope is that Kate um, Blanchett will be the narrator. She'll do the voiceover work. So um, um, and hopefully on July 8th, and then we'll have it ready for Toronto. Um, so the last clip I'm going to show you is called uh, One in a Billion. And this is a hilarious uh, film about uh, made by a brother and sister who I adore. I produced um, his, uh, Gita's first film called Project Kashmir, and she decided to turn the cameras on her family because her brother was turning 30 and he wasn't married. And his, her parents were just distraught that she was 34 and she hasn't been married. And uh, they were from India, and they were they they her parents are. Um, Met, they've met through an arranged marriage. And um, so they have always assumed that their children would marry Indians. And it's just a look into the, the world of first generation Americans <coughs> and how important it is for families to hold on to their culture and their beliefs and their religious traditions. Um, and then what has to happen when you don't want to disappoint your parents, but you're probably going to outgrow a custom like arranged marriages. So it's very, very funny. And um, we'll just show you a clip about that. <coughs> Each other for all of two days. I don't know how they fell in love, but they're the happiest couple I've ever seen. I've always been expected to marry an Indian girl, and I always thought I would, until I met Audrey. I didn't really think we were going to like, date for that long. I was like, tell my parents to break up. I was like, break up. Do I need to marry an Indian girl to be happy? Uh-huh. The way you guys married, would that have worked for me as well? Yeah. 100% I believe from the bottom of the heart. Now, how are we going to set it up? Let's talk about it. Something will happen or I'm married Dad sent me 20 bio datas, basically 20 pictures and resumes of matrimonial <coughs> candidates. I'm going to cold call them, which is totally normal, right? Hey, my name is Ravi. My mother, Champa, gave me your bio data, which was given to her by Kokila Ben, who was given to her by Mahindra Ben, who happens to be your uncle, I think. You guys are treating me like I'm like we're socially retarded at that. Now I have to go on dates all over the country. Hey, I'm Ravi. Nice to meet you. Hey, I'm Ravi. Hey, I'm Ravi. What's going on? <laughs> this is part of my midlife crisis. I need therapy. That's all, that's all the conclusion I've come to. I compare every girl I meet yeah. to her. Is there a term for it? The Indian problem? 
Is there any scenario in which I could marry a girl who's not Indian? But you want to get married, right? I can't believe I'm turning 30. I'm trying to just grow up a bit. If I go to Indiana and I have a girl party, it's going to be cold, red. is good with that boy, but that boy is good with this girl. So everybody is good because everybody get married at the end. All the girls and all the boys get married. <laughs> <coughs> so that's just a fun film and we're just we're just finishing that as well. So that's all that's all I that's all I got. <laughs> We're running already over time, so um, I don't know if anybody has a Can you just tell them the one thing about Ted Hope? I think this is hysterical. How you, oh, yeah, the so independent films, he's the big guy. In so the Ted film. Hope is, uh, he's, he grew up in, um, in Merrimack, West, and West Newbury. West Newbury and Merrimack. Yeah, he moved from both, they, yeah. but anyways, he, um, he went to Pentucket with me through middle school, and I always remember he had like these long beetle bangs and Coke bottle glasses and his nose was always like in a comic book or The Hobbit, you know, and, and uh, I was at the Sundance Film Festival and it was a year that um, American Splendor won and it was produced by Ted Hope and I'm like, that, that has to be the same Ted Hope I went to high school with because he, oh, he used to read American Splendor, like I didn't know what American Splendor was, but he used to read these comic books all the time. And it turns out that it was, and he's, he literally is like a historic figure in, in American cinema. He's, he's produced over 50 movies. Um, he, he's amazing, he's an amazing storyteller, but he's, he's gifted to, to find, he's, he's really well known to be someone that discovers new voices. And he's very generous, so he's, he's always um, nurturing and supporting independent cinema. Well, and we've become very good friends. And what about the email? You said the email. You would, would you write the email? Is that my memory yes. of this? Is are you the, the sage? Yeah. Are you the sage? Yeah. 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 You sent him an email. Yeah, and he didn't email me back right away. <laughs> but then we met in New York, yeah. and he's just he's just he's quirky and funny and smart. And his wife and I are now making a movie together about China. Um, so we're making a film about, uh, we followed John Huntsman, who was our governor um, <coughs> in the state of Utah. He became the ambassador to China um, in the first term of the Obama administration. So we, um, that actually was another, actually that wasn't my idea either, it was Vanessa's idea. She said, um, you know, you're, it looks like your governor is going to become the next, you know, ambassador to China, and I want to make a movie on U.S.-Chinese diplomacy. Do you think he'll let us do an interview? And um, so we, we went and we met with them, and then they allowed to, they allowed us to follow them in China for two years with cameras, which was amazing. That country is just, it's just mind blowing to see what's happening over there. So um, that was really fun. And so Ted's producing the movie. Um, Ted and I are producing his wife's film. So okay. now we're we're we're, we're, uh, we're back together. Yeah. And he loves to tell everybody, you know, because you can't believe we we live in this really small town, like we're five thousand people. And I'm like, yeah, I used to call it Graveland. And, he's like, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> and so, um, but Ted is like a giant. You should Google him. I mean, he, he, I mean, so many of the best films made in independent cinema. Who are these family? Are these Well, you know, you can get them all on Netflix now, and you can get them in your library. Libraries are really great about buying. I mean, now like at forty percent of. The library acquisitions are, are digital, right? I mean, I don't know if that's true. We do have a lot of electronic. Yeah. And then also, Geraldyn just donated several of her films to us too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's 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 a, it, that is a another place people forget about. You know, their libraries for these kinds of things. But they, the library is a great resource to see these films. And um, most of them are good on television, but then you have to watch them when they're on television. So, mm -hmm. but now everything's changing now with the streaming and on demand. You, should, you know, there'll be a time when you'll be able to find anything and watch it whenever you want. We're not there yet in terms of uh, technology, but it's it's close. It's getting there. Mm -hmm. <coughs>
Great. Any other questions? Can you speak a little bit about your um, business, your, your corporation? Right? Oh, Impact Partners. Impact Partners. Yeah. So we started a film fund to finance social impact documentaries, which is why it looks like I'm making all these films, but actually we're financing a lot of films. And then my partner and I often will executive produce one of the films that we're financing. It's sort of like in the venture capital model, you take a board seat of a company and you help nurture the idea. And this, we, we set up this fund very much like a venture fund for uh, what we call triple bottom line films, so the social impact I mean, the first film has to be, there has to be a great film first because if it's not a great film, nobody's going to watch it and nobody's going to buy it. So it's it's always sort of story driven, and then social impact is the, the next criteria that we look at, at, at how much of a difference can this make, um, and then um, we also look at commercial viability. Like, can can we recoup our money? Can we get our money out? Because you don't make money in documentary films. You, nobody does. But you can you can put some money in and get it out. And so our fund has really become like almost like a revolving loan fund where we, our investors get their money back. They're very happy. Like I, I literally get calls. All of our investors are very wealthy individuals. They're like, you send me a check. Nobody sends me a check. I always have to write the checks. I'm like, yeah, that's our job. We're sending you your check back. Now put it in another film. <laughs> so yeah, so it is. It really is like a revolving loan yeah. fund. Um, so, but it's great. Our investors are happy. Our filmmakers are happy. We get to see a lot of really good things. And and we're not really doing anything that's special. We're just we're we're, we're actually trying to help rationalize a very broken market. So we're trying to get money, we're trying to get capital to people faster than the, the market would get it to them so they can get their films done right. and out into the world in a more efficient way. Um, so it's really not rocket science that what we're doing, but it's uh, it's been effective and we now have a brand that's like, you know, very respected. Like the, we had, um, uh, we actually had seven films at Sundance last year, not five. Um, and uh, that's huge. No, 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 no. I, I just, I was just when I was when I realized what the square was there, and I was like, oh, I couldn't yeah. remember. But we we've been very lucky because, you know, it's 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 a, uh, it's the documentary world's a small world, and like there's not any money. So like if you have you have a sign that says we have money, like they find you, <laughs> and then they come and they pitch you. Really, you know, you, you our our film. Uh, we have a woman that works on our staff. She looks at 500 films a year, and we fund about 20 of them. How do you, you market? Know? What? How do you market? Um, well, we we don't have to market ourselves because we sell our films, and then our brand markets who we are. Like we we have an, we have a website, but we don't like have to like pay for advertising that says, "Hey, we have money. Come find us." Actually, people find you if you if you, the word is out that you have you, this this really interesting fund, and they give you grants and they give you equity, and you know they work with you. Um, so we haven't found marketing to be a problem, and we actually have more investors. We have like capped. We have a waiting list of people that want to come into our fund as investors, and we just started a new fund called Game Changer. Which is going to support women directors because one of the uh, one of the films that we did called Misrepresentation, which looked at the misrepresentation of women in the media. Um, one of the problems is is that you know less than seven percent of the movies being made are being directed or written by women, and so we see that as a huge market opportunity. That there's a lot of talent out there, and the market has been very inefficient and biased towards women directors. And so we've started a fund that's going to, um, because there's a lot of talent, and so the, the, we're going to start a fund that, that's going to support women directors in the narrative space, which is a totally new world. Um, you know, I was on a call today, at, I'm learning so much because making narrative films is very different than documentary films, because it's all direct, you know, you have your director, then you have to get your cast, and you, you know, you, you lose a star, and you lose your financing, and you lose, you know, it takes longer actually to do sometimes independent films than it does documentaries. Um, so, but it's fun. And um, and that, we do need to market, because we need investors. So if you know anybody that wants to invest in women directors, <laughs> tell them to come see me. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 So, anyways. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>